What's going on folks and welcome back to some more tips for broken ranks. If you haven't already watched my first video for 13 tips related to early game, I highly recommend checking those out before this one because this will dive into some more intermediate tips for the game. Let's go ahead and get right to it. So in the last video, we talked a little bit about the pet system and at what level you get your first one for free. Well, I want to start off by saying that at level 22, we will also get a quest line to receive another one for free. This one is going to be the flying bat. To expand on that previous pet though, during my time in the game I found that initially, some people prefer to keep the level 7 dog and continue to level that up instead of the bat. The bleed on it is extremely useful. Because these pets level up with us as we gain experience, the wolfhound is perfectly capable of progressing with you as a result, especially if you do everything you can to keep your pets safe. One thing to point out however is that at level 35 at least, we do not get another quest for getting a free pet, but you have around 4 different pet choices by this point that you can decide on. The next tip is that you'll find early on in Broken Ranks that potions, also known as elixirs, might be a little difficult to come by. Well, there are actually multiple ways you can obtain these, and the first way is by having them crafted. If you visit Bandit Forest and go to where the spiders are located, you'll notice one of the champion mobs known as the Tangler. Mixing the Tangler Venom with spider eggs will allow you to trade for mana, health, and stamina potions at the Doctor and Trentis. It's the same building on the southeast side that you normally come out of when you die in that area. The next and much easier way to get them would be at the vendor in the druid village. You can buy these for platinum and by this time you should have gotten some platinum for free just from leveling up alongside getting some for free from quest lines along the way. The next thing you want to know is about capes or cloaks in this game, how to get them and what they offer you. Alongside looking incredibly badass, capes are actually very useful because they provide extra stats for your character. As far as I know, the only vendor you'll be able to buy them from at the start is the Druid Village vendor named Zohar after you finish the Druidic questline, but these capes also require level 30 plus. However, if you wanted to farm capes that can drop before then, you can actually kill the Chieftain and the Crossbiter bosses for a chance at this, and these capes will be level 20 instead. Speaking of dungeons, another thing to know is that if you plan on partying up with other players for a dungeon, here's a tip on how to clear them at a faster rate. When you go into dungeons that normally have a boss at the end, you'll notice that they'll be scattered with trash mobs on the way there. Now typically someone would assume that you would want to stay in your full 5 man party and fight the pack one by one. However, there's a much faster way to do this. If you split up your party into groups of 1-2 to two players, that means that more battles can happen at once. If one person engages in a fight, and you'll see this in the open world, your character can walk right over them to fight the next one, or go about your merry way. Using this mechanic makes the dungeons go faster, because having 3 or 5 battles going on at once with 10 second round timers as opposed to one at a time, you'll reach the boss much faster. The next tip to go over will be inventory management alongside buying gear from merchants. When you first open your inventory, you'll notice that you'll have 5 different categories that you can shift through. Your armor, weapons, jewelry, pet equipment, and other. And the other tab is normally where you'll find any quest items, potions, junk or resources, that sort of thing. It's a similar situation except there are a couple very useful tools for filtering out what you don't want. The first useful thing is you can use filters at the bottom of the vendor side of the window. These ranks will indicate what items you want to select in the window and don't want to see. Just above that you have three small options. One allows you to show gear just for fighters, one allows you to show gear for mages, and the last one is for gear you can equip. In the top right portion you click the drop down arrow to filter different armor, weapons, and even miscellaneous items. Using all of these filters in conjunction should enable you to have a much smoother shopping experience. The next tip to go over is when to use mental defense and how it can be very useful in PvP depending on what you're fighting. This is something I talked about briefly in the combat overview video I did, but mental defense protects you against not only debuffs, but mental attacks as well. The voodoo class has most of its attacks under the mental defense, so if you come across one in PvP, you'll probably want to put your points there. But on top of that, if you're fighting someone like a fire mage, putting mental defense in early on can be very useful because that's exactly when they'll try to cast debuffs on you. And since that takes away from action points they can put into other things, that means if you make it more difficult for them, they might have to spend more turns trying to debuff you while you're already starting your main combos. When it comes to monsters and NPCs, this can be a similar situation to use this tactic. However, there are some mobs later on in the game that specialize in mental attacks as well. And keep in mind, I did mention last video how if I know a certain mob will prioritize using melee or ranged attacks, I'd normally allocate more defenses in that direction, but most of the mobs are completely capable of switching it up. A warrior might decide to throw rocks at you instead of attacking for example, but this probably won't be nearly as powerful as if they had successfully attacked you with melee in the first place. And it's the same for mobs that specialize in mental attacks. 
Sometimes you can tell if the NPC looks like a warlock or it's a ghost or dark magic type of enemy. A lot of times those will end up being the ones you can allocate mental defense for, but unless you already know what to expect going in, you might just have to find out through trial and error with some of them. And one extra thing is that as far as PvP goes, even the normal skill known as War Cry can have its use here because that will after all reduce the enemy's chance to hit with melee, ranged, and mental attacks. But I still wouldn't focus on leveling it up unless maybe you're a druid or a knight. The next thing to talk about would be the wisdom requirements you may have seen while browsing your different class skills. We're going to go over what it means and how you can use it to your advantage. So wisdom actually stands for knowledge. It's the very last stat in your character menu and is normally associated with classes such as the Druid, Voodoo, and Fire Mage. However, this stat does more than just increasing your chance to avoid certain attacks. It also encompasses all the buffs and debuffs. Because of this, that means that even if you're playing a melee character, when you try to cast positive or negative spells, also known as buffs and debuffs, it will take your knowledge into account. Whenever you see a skill that has a difficulty rating, you can hover over it to bring up a tooltip. This will tell you how much knowledge you need to cast this buff with 100% chance depending on how many action points you allocate. So for me as a Sheed character, if I want to use Breath Control, this means I only need the baseline amount of knowledge which is 10. But if I only want to use 2 or 1 action points and allocate the rest elsewhere, I'm going to need many more points put into my knowledge stat. It's also good to point out that certain gear will have knowledge requirements, such as van braces. I don't fully know what their use is, but I remember reading some people specifically wanting 20 points of knowledge to be able to wear them. And speaking of stat thresholds being required by gear, that brings us to the next tip. In Broken Ranks, you will be coming across gear throughout the entire game that will have stat requirements. The thing to know is that the requirement will be for the base amount of the stat, not the total. Meaning if you have a piece of gear that increases your dexterity from 30 to 40, you won't be able to automatically wear a piece that requires 40 points. This can be good to know because that means that even if you're planning to do a more unique build, you'll still need to follow the gear stat requirements if you want to upgrade. The next thing to talk about are synergetics. These are the reddish pink colored items you can obtain from farming bosses. I've been told that these are actually random and that any boss can drop any synergetic, but I've yet to be able to confirm that. What we do know is that these are new types of items that are mostly armor based. You should not see any synergetic weapons rolling around. However, you will see the blue grade weapons known as rares, or even epics if someone gets extremely lucky. When you do get these synergetics, you're also able to merge them together to create an even higher level version of the item. So if I wanted to merge these synergetic pants, I would need to get another one either from the cross spider boss I got it from originally, or another boss. And both champions plus bosses are also really good for farming experience, and later on you'll find yourself spending a lot of your time with these. The next tip we'll want to talk about is Trifkin Isle. This is a place that will open up to you fully at level 30, and can be accessed by using the portal in the cavern just west of Leskar's Inn. But when you do this quest line, it'll take you to one of the estates and a portal to the island will be in Trifkin's room. After the quest is fully done though, you should be able to go back to the portal in the cavern whenever you want. This island provides us with daily quest lines that provide gold and can provide us with a little bit of experience. It's good to make sure you come back here every day, but also keep an eye on the chat because quite often dynamic events will spawn here too. If you can party up with people to do these, I highly recommend it because some of the mobs can be pretty tough to fight. But also you can get a better reward if you choose the party option in the missing guards daily quest line. And then we have two more tips. The first one I don't even know how I didn't realize this, but when you open the map, you can go to the exploration section and see exactly how many side quest lines, main story quest lines, champions, bosses, etc. are in each zone. This is extremely useful for keeping track of what you haven't done yet and giving you an idea of what you can do. Highly recommend checking this regularly, and thank you guys so much that pointed this out during our last livestream. And the final tip goes over the resting mechanic. It's a pretty small tip, but one that I wanted to showcase after that previous livestream we had. Someone had mentioned to me that right after the battles are done, you can actually start resting while you're in the middle of a loading screen. But also, when you are initially loading into battle, you can use the hotkeys 1-4 through four to set your combat strategies up before the 10 round timer even starts. For some people this can be very useful, just in case you're still getting used to where you need to click on what skills you want. But with that, that's everything we have to talk about for this tips video. I hope you enjoy it and that at least a chunk of this is going to help you. But as always, if you have any others you'd like to add, please leave them in the comments below. Just